President. Tom, good to see you. Good to see you. Good. I was hiking and I tripped. Uh, she's a short story. Oh, wow. But I go out of town for a couple of weeks and you, you conclude to do with your mom and you play at my home course, KJL. I love okay. that course. Is that your home course? Yeah. That's yeah. a great course. I've been there since the very beginning. The, uh, you live up there? No, no. We live in the desert. I, I commute there. You know, once a week, I go up on weekends. How far is it from the desert? 55 hours. Yeah. 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 That's a really nice place. Like, yeah, I really like it. Yeah, yeah cool. it was one of my favorites. I think that and RTJ. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's and Manassas. Uh, those are probably the two that I like the most. Great. Uh, but it was, it was beautiful. Charlie? Who did you play? You did, who, who hosted you? Was it a member or somebody? I don't know. I, I didn't have to play with them. Which was fun. Which was fun. Yeah. Which was fun. But everybody was very gracious. Great. And, uh, really nice. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But it's, it's pretty. Those it's poplar so trees are gorgeous. Yeah. No, it's, uh, it's worth going up for a weekend for you. Know, for us. Really pretty. So. so Tom, Hondo's going to attract the time here. Uh, I can't see her. Who's <laughs> on? Who's on? I should set her watch for two hours. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> That's what I'm told. But she'll, so she'll, uh, she'll keep That's you guys on time. Great. OK. And, uh, where's your job? Yeah. Yeah, this is a really important moment. Right. Uh, well, let's go. Uh, uh, no, 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 you guys have to react quickly. Please. Everybody all set? On set. Good. We rolling? Let me know. Rolling. Rolling. Mr. President, thank you very much for sitting down with the New York Times today in this really historic moment. Um, let me begin with the sort of the broadest criticism um, that I see out there, and some of which you know I've, I've made myself, which is that. Um, we had six world powers on one side of the table. We had Iran alone on the other side of the table. How come we weren't able to translate that leverage into not just eliminating Iran's uh, ability to be a threshold nuclear power in a decade, but eliminating its nuclear enrichment infrastructure entirely? That seems to be the biggest criticism. Yeah, and I, and I think that criticism is, is misguided. Let's see exactly what we obtained. We have cut off every pathway for Iran to develop a nuclear weapon. The reason we were able to unify the world community around the most effective sanctions regime we've ever set up, a sanction regime that crippled the Iranian economy and ultimately brought them to the table, was because the world agreed with us that it would be a great danger to the region, to our allies, to the world, if Iran possessed a nuclear weapon. We did not have that kind of global consensus around the notion that Iran can't enjoy any nuclear power whatsoever. And as a member of the Non-Proliferation Treaty, the NPT, uh, their argument was we're entitled to have a peaceful nuclear program. And what we were able to do is to say to them, given your past behavior, given uh, our strong suspicion and evidence that you made attempts to weaponize your nuclear program, given the destabilizing activities that you've engaged in in the region in support for terrorism. It's not enough for us to trust when you say that you are only creating a peaceful nuclear program. You have to prove it to us. And so this whole system that we've built is not based on trust. It's based on a verifiable mechanism whereby every pathway that they have is shut off. The pathway of enriched uranium, they have to remove 98% of the enriched uranium they have they have to remove the overwhelming majority of their cascades. And for 10 years, they are under the most severe constraints. And then beyond that, they still have to sign up to an additional protocol that ensures we have the most intrusive inspection regime that's ever been created. They had a facility that, a heavy water facility that could have created plutonium that was weapons grade. They have to entirely reconfigure that. They had a facility for that that was underground and so it would have been hard to reach. They have to remove uh, effectively the cascades there that could have developed uh, uh, nuclear material. So across the board, what we've been able to do is to assure that Iran will not get a nuclear weapon and that was always the premise, Tom, of us building this strong international sanctions regime. Uh, the notion that the world signed up for these sanctions in order to either achieve regime change, to
to solve every problem in terms of Iranian behavior, uh, or to say to them in perpetuity they can never have peaceful nuclear power. That was never something uh, that was in the cards. You pick up something that we talked about last time we uh, discussed this subject. I, mean, I feel like you have an intuition about Iran from the very beginning that you feel this is a country that was a great civilization uh, historically, that has enormous human capital, right. and that somehow if we could turn this ship around uh, after it being a source of great instability in this region, right. it would unlock a, a lot of different possibilities. And the way you've tried that with Cuba as well. It, for 50 years, we were pursuing policies that clearly didn't produce any outcome. But talk about, talk about how you see Iran historically and why this agreement might leverage these new possibilities. Well, I, I think Iran and Cuba are two different circumstances. Cuba is a very small country, 90 miles off our border, that for a whole series of uh, historical reasons, uh, we have maintained a Cold War posture. They don't pose a significant threat to us or any of our allies in the region. Uh, our main concern there is just to make sure that uh, over time it opens up so that the Cuban people are free. And I think the change in policy is designed to try to accomplish that. With respect to Iran, it is a great civilization, but it also has an authoritarian theocracy in charge that is anti-American, anti-Israeli, anti-Semitic, sponsors terrorism, and there are a whole host of real profound differences that we have between them. And so, initially, we have a much more modest goal, which is to make sure Iran does not have a nuclear weapon, because if they had a nuclear weapon, that would turbocharge some of the activities that they conducted around the region in a way that would make it more difficult for us to deal with and our allies to deal with. I do believe that there are tensions inside of Iran. What's interesting if you look at what's happened over the last several months is uh, the opponents of this deal are the hardliners and those who are most invested in Iran's sponsorship of terrorism, most invested in destabilizing Iran's neighbors, uh, most virulently anti-American and anti-Israeli. And that should tell us something because uh, those hardliners are invested in a status quo in which Iran is isolated uh, and they are in power. They become the only game in town. Not just militarily, they call the shots, but economically, they're able to exploit uh, the workarounds from sanctions in order to fatten themselves. Uh, in a situation in which you have a different base of business people and commerce inside of Iran, that may change how they think about the costs and benefits of these destabilizing activities. But we're not counting on that. And, and that's the thing I want to emphasize, Tom, because even over the last uh, several weeks and today uh, as we announced the deal, what's been striking to me is that increasingly the critics are shifting off the nuclear issue. And they're moving into, well, even if the nuclear issue is dealt with, there's still going to be sponsoring terrorism. And there's going to get uh, this sanctions relief, and so they're going to have more money to engage in these bad activities. Uh, that is a possibility, and we are going to have to systematically guard against that and work with our allies, the Gulf countries, Israel, to stop the work that they are doing outside of the nuclear program. But the central premise here is that if they got a nuclear weapon, that would be different. And on that score, we have achieved our, object, uh, our objective. Prime Minister Netanyahu, Netanyahu you spoke to this morning, he's right. called this a historic right. mistake. Two, two questions um, about that. Because what you hear from the Israelis is Obama just doesn't understand evil. Yes. These guys are evil, right. number one. Um, uh, and, and, and number two, um, you know, they, they deal with the Iranians obviously every day. So my question is this, really. Why do you, what, what did you say to him? Uh, and what would you say to the Israeli, Israeli people? But um, what, are, what are they missing? Well, what I've said to Prime Minister Netanyahu is the same thing that I've said publicly, which is we don't measure our actions against some ideal. It would be great if Iran was suddenly transformed into a liberal democracy 
that embraced good relations with Israel and the United States and had no interest in any nuclear program whatsoever, that would be my preference. That's not right. uh, an available option. So what I've said to Prime Minister Netanyahu is, this is our best option to make sure that not just for the first 10 years, but for years afterwards, we have a verifiable inspection regime that ensures they do not obtain a nuclear weapon. That is worth an enormous amount in terms of our national security and Israel's national security and our other allies' national security in the region. It also prevents the possibility of a nuclear arms race in the region. Now, what is also true is that by getting this nuclear deal, they have not agreed to suddenly stop some of the activities in the region that's dangerous to us. And we're going to have to continue to press and push against that. But the notion that somehow we'd be better off if we did not have this deal assumes either that we could sustain these sanctions and squeeze them so hard that ultimately they capitulated. There's no evidence and no expert that I've spoken to who thinks that. And in fact, the evidence is the contrary. If this deal did not go through, it was more likely that Iran would obtain a nuclear weapon, which would be a bigger threat to Israel. Or alternatively, that ultimately the only way to solve this problem was militarily, uh, which oftentimes the critics don't want to own because they know that uh, populations inside the United States, for that matter, inside of Israel, had real concerns about a military uh, strike. So what I've said to Prime Minister Netanyahu is, number one, this achieves the initial goal on which we all agreed, which was Iran should not get a nuclear weapon. Now, Prime Minister Netanyahu would prefer, and many of the critics would prefer, that they don't even have any nuclear capacity. But really what that involves is uh, eliminating uh, the presence of knowledge inside of Iran. That nuclear technology is not that complicated today. And so uh, the notion that the, the yardstick for success was now whether they ever had the capacity possibly to obtain nuclear weapons, that can't be the yardstick. The question is, do we have the kind of inspection regime and safeguards and international consensus whereby it's not worth it for them to do it? We have accomplished that. What we are going to also have to do, though, uh, is to continue to work with our Israeli friends, Saudis, Emiratis, the Gulf uh, countries, and uh, the world community to make sure that Iran is held accountable for the other activities that we find odious, destabilizing, dangerous. And we still have tools in our toolkit to deal with those. Just because we are removing the nuclear-related sanctions, not only have we obtained an agreement whereby they're still barred under this new resolution from uh, importing ballistic missile technology for eight years. The arms embargo stays in place for five years. But our unilateral sanctions 